I'm going to pray, and when I do, the power of God's going to come upon you. Get ready. In the name of Jesus, fire, 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 so well wow look at you you've done so good hey look at you fire a god on her wow look at that <laughs> Ooh. honestly either we are crazy but you can't make this stuff up the lights go out it's probably about 70 people there and the fire of god hits and it was like the room was just, and for the next two and a half hours, the power just hits. And all these kids, and they wrote me all letters to say thank you. I got uh, about like 70, 80 letters. And no jokes, about 20, 25 plus, first time I'd ever experienced the power of God. Turn someone next to you and say, you can experience God's power tonight. <laughs> God touched me, and for seven days, I had an encounter. I didn't just have an encounter. What God wanted to do in me, He wanted to do through me. You don't need to be touched just for you. You need to be touched for the nations. You don't need to encounter God just for this thing that you're struggling through. You need to encounter God for your family, for the business you're in. You need a touch from God. Shit. Put a hand on someone next to you and say, fire. <laughs> oh, Jen, I'm having such a good time with you. Fire fall. Fire fall. Fire fall. New York City, you've experienced the baptism of John and water, but I come with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire fall, fire fall, fire fall, fire fall, fire fall. There it is. There comes a moment when you have to provoke heaven. There comes a moment where you have to say, God, turn your eyes to this nation. God is not done with America. We are at a turning point. We are at a turning point. We've reached a tipping point. Over my shoulder is a ball that drops. And once a year when that ball drops, it declares a new year. But I say in the spiritual realm, there is a ball dropping over my shoulder right now that is declaring a new, that is declaring a new day. 
I call to the end of the seeker-sensitive movement. It is over. We will carry the ark. We will be a person of the presence of Jesus Christ. There's a turning point in this nation. Division is over. It's a new year. Denominationalism is dead. Let the true worshipers arise from the north to the south to the east to the west there's one body there's one baptism there's one jesus there's one holy ghost let the church arise over my shoulder in the spiritual realm is a ball dropping that's declaring the end of guilt and shame and condemnation you used to have to have a seminary degree and now God is simply looking for a yes. We don't have time. There's an urgency in Second Peter. When we talk about the return of Christ, I'm not talking about canceling all your plans. I'm talking about the urgency that produces anguish that on the inside of you, you're disturbed. You're at your job and something is turning in your belly because you look at the faces of your coworkers and you know they're bound for hell, for hell. Because whatever your vocation is, I can assure you, it does not exist in heaven. In heaven, there are sons and daughters and there's gotta be a desperation inside of you that's in, that says, when we sing the song, Spirit Break Out, we mean break all the way out. Have you ever been in a service where you've heard the fire of God is coming down or a minister say fire come down or fire fall down? Maybe you've been in a service where uh, you've led worship like I did for years and, and I've been in these services where the fire of God was said to have been uh, evident and had shown up and even sing about it in worship to sing fire fall down and sing it over and over and over again. Maybe you participated in fire tunnels, which for those listening that are not familiar with those, a row of people on one side, row on the other, and the middle part is left empty for people to walk through. And as you walk through, you're receiving an impartation from the people that are laying hands on you as you're going through the fire tunnel. And sometimes you may go through more than once. <laughs> some of this may be very familiar to those of you listening and some of you again this may be new such as the clips that we heard at the beginning those may be people you know of and may not for instance the first two clips came from rodney howard brown services where people were running around the building uh, jumping up and down. There's other footage that you can find online where people are rolling on the floor, screaming, uh, jerking their clothes off, their their coats and things, and and they're reacting. They're laughing. They're crying. They're, ro again, rolling in the floor. A lot of different manifestations that are happening because of him calling down the fire of God repetitively. The next clip that we heard came from a service that was on Bethel Moments. It was th their own clip that talked about the young saints from Bethel. And the gentleman that was speaking, his name was Richard Gordon. He's from South Africa. He is an um, associate pastor that also serves for BSSM on the online uh, campus, part of the Supernatural School of Ministry. But we're going to be listening to some clips of him today from a recent service done two weeks ago. But he's sharing there about the fire of God that fell at a youth camp from ages 10 to 14 year olds after the lights were turned out. And he was talking about light in the darkness. And you can hear these young kids on this video uh, telling their stories of their encounters. And, and you heard him talk about the fire of God and uh, referencing a young girl that's laying in the floor that's uh, under the power of God, he says, and the fire of God's all over her. And talking about how we need an encounter because the encounter helps other people and ministers to nations. And then the last clip that we heard actually came from a service last night in Times Square. And this is extending over from what's called the Domino Revival that's headed up by Mike Signorelli. And he is talking about the fire falling down in Times Square. 
and beginning to talk about how uh, church is not going to be as normal as it used to be and and saying that denominationalism is going to be done away with and, and other things are going to be done away with. But the main focus is the fire of God. What is the fire of God? Uh, what can we know about what the fire of God is and what it is not? And have there been some misunderstandings about the fire of God as far as in areas of the charismatic movement? And what some of us have come to know and understand and what we were told about the fire of God and and the experiential part of it versus what scripture actually says about it. We're going to talk about that today and look at some clips, uh, again, from Richard Gordon from Bethel. And we're going to see what scripture says about the fire of God and offer some points for consideration. So I hope you find this episode helpful today as we dig into this topic on the fire of God. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. One of my most personal favorite accounts in scripture is reading in Luke 24. I've always enjoyed reading about the road to Emmaus and how the disciples responded and how Jesus corrected them. And years later, after coming out of the hyper-charismatic and New Apostolic Reformation and revisiting those passages, it's much more beautiful now understanding it in the right context and seeing how the disciples were ministered to by Jesus himself, beginning with Moses and all the prophets testifying of himself, he opened the scriptures to them. And then as he disappears from their sight after the breaking of the bread, they say in that well-known passage in Luke 24, verse 32, did our hearts not burn within us as he opened up the scriptures to us? And I love what Matthew Henry has to say on the commentary of this passage regarding those disciples and that particular verse. He says there was a divine heat that came with a divine light as Jesus revealed to them about himself in the word of God. There is a desire that many of us have that we want to burn with, with passion, with zeal for God. And that's not a wrong thing. It's not wrong for us to have that fervency, that zeal, that desire to serve the Lord and to minister uh, in spirit and in truth, to worship Him in spirit and truth. What happens, though, when you're in this particular type of movement and the fire of God is talked about is that you don't hear it in the proper context many times. And the passages that are referred to, such as Matthew 3.11, which we'll visit today, And there are many others that we could talk about. And as always, I'm going to present some resources to you that may be of help. And again, that's to get you started on Bible study for yourself. And from there, to continue to look at some of these topics and to look at some of these things to make sure that you have a proper biblical understanding. Because my concern now is that when we talk about the fire of God that uh, and we hear people in this movement that are talking about it. I'm, I'm concerned that they don't really understand the the full the full intent and the sobriety of what they're really talking about when they're calling down fire. And I know that they probably may mean it in a way of give us more passion, God, give us more desire. But there's also some elements of fire in Scripture re- pertaining to God that that are not being considered. I know I can share something personally before we dive into what we're going to look at today from Richard Gordon from Bethel. When I mentioned Rodney Howard Brown at the first two clips, I personally was in um, services years ago when he came to our area and experienced some of these things that he's known for. He's known as the Holy Ghost bartender, for one thing, um, that people have fits of laughter, and I experienced that and the fire, and him saying the fire of God. And so I've been in services with individuals such as Rodney Howard Brown and experienced some of these things. And looking back now, I can most assuredly say there's no fruit in my life that came from that that's good fruit. That, that bore fruit in keeping with repentance, that bore fruit as far as spiritual maturity. There was none of that. And so that has to be rejected as, as an experience that's not glorifying Christ. And I want to talk about this today. I've had some people reach out to me. And if there's any topics that, by the way, if, uh, if you have topics that you want me to consider talking about and discussing, I'm happy to do so. You can always email me, and I have the information at the end of my podcast. But I wanted to talk about this today as uh, it is a good topic to discuss from what uh, I came out of and many of us came out of 
and someone had reached out to me about considering talking about this. So today we're going to be looking at the teaching from Richard Gordon. The video we're looking at today was posted on Bethel's YouTube channel on October 22nd of 2023, Sunday evening service. There was no special title given to this service, but Richard Gordon begins to minister. It was about a four hour long service. Uh, granted, he didn't speak the full four hours. Of, there was worship and then the offering with their declarations. So I fast forwarded up to where Richard begins to minister. And when he first starts, he begins by calling down the fire of God and stirs the people's emotions for roughly about 10 minutes. Wow. Turn to someone next to you and say, tonight's a good night. Just tap someone besides you and say, you're about to encounter Jesus tonight. Fire God. Fire God. Shit. Just tap someone near you and say, God's going to mark me tonight. <laughs> Why don't you look at the carpet? <laughs> Say this after me. Say, carpet. carpet. We're going to be friends tonight. <laughs> oh. Wow. <sighs> Turn to someone next to you and say, I think your life could get changed tonight. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let's put a hand on the person's shoulder near you and just say, Wow. Put a hand on your own belly and say, wow. <laughs> Woo! The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hey. It sounds kind of chaotic, doesn't it? They're sitting in their seats and they're screaming and reacting to what he's saying. And there's a lot of emotionalism in this and setting the atmosphere for something to happen that God's going to do, building up the, the tension in the room, the, the climax that's going to be experienced by them at the end of the service. So this is all a, a build up to this and it keeps going. There's going to be several clips that we listen to today to get the feel for this, especially for those that listen to this and they may have never been in services like this. Some of us have been in services that not exactly like this, but we know what this is when when there's this buildup of the fire of God and there are things being done, the music in the background is being played, different elements that are inserted here to help set the atmosphere and set the tone for, for doing this. And this may be unintentional that this is going on, but this is being done here and the continuing repetitive nature of saying the fire of God. God, uh, calling these things down and and calling these things into the atmosphere, if you will, and into into existence. So let's listen to a little bit longer, and then we're going to keep going. I can feel faith in the room. Fire, God! Fire, God! Fire, God! Fire, God! Oh. Hey, Jesus, won't you come down, down, down to the next to me place with a smile on your face and a song in my ear? Oh, hey, Jesus, come and play with me. Hey, Jesus, I'm just a little boy that at eight years old struggled with anxiety, depression, and suicide. Hey, Jesus, I'm just a broken young man 
a broken jar waiting for you to pour yourself into me. Hey, Jesus, I may not have my whole life put together. I may not have everything perfect, but won't you come down, down, down to the next to me place with a smile on your face and a song in my ear, because I want to play. I want to play, Jesus. Hey, Jesus. Turn to someone next to you and say, Hey, Jesus. Fire, God. Fire, God. Fire, God. Fire, God. I played those at the beginning just so you can have an understanding again of what's going on. And the Hey, Jesus, I don't know if that's a song he wrote. I don't know if that's a song he heard. But again, you can hear that there's this appeal to personal experience of wanting Jesus to come and play. There is a caution I would like to give uh, in this movement that it, people tend to treat Jesus in some ways almost as if uh, they they put him in just the humanity portion. They forget that he's God. And so there is this sincerity that that seems to come across when people are talking like this, but they are really acting in an irreverent way. Uh, So I would just caution against that. I know some people may get upset or frustrated when hearing that type of critique being given, uh, but we are to remember who Jesus is and that He is our King. He is our Lord and Savior. He's not our boyfriend. He's not our big brother in the sense of, yeah, come tickle me and play with me, Jesus. And He's he's not like that. We've got to understand, yes, we do have a relationship with Him. We do have fellowship with God. And in that, we must remember the role of His relationship to us. And so I would just caution because there's some irreverence that comes across in that. Now, as Richard goes on in this, um, and I listened to the teaching and what he ministered. And so I'm not going to be playing clips of what he ministered. I'm going to be summarizing it for you for time's sake. And also because the main focus today is on the fire of God. So he goes on to talk about uh, Mary going to the tomb of Jesus with the stone rolled away. And he says that God is getting ready to roll the stones that have been stuck so that's what he takes from away from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it would seem, that, that Jesus is going to be rolling some stones away that are stuck, especially for women, because God is going to mark women. And Richard says that God is going to break protocol in the role of women. And he uses the story of Mary finding the tomb of Jesus empty in order to make that statement. And he also says that he recognizes the angels assign in the pillars of light for the saints, in the room. And so it's seeming that he's conveying he sees into the spirit and sees the angels and the pillars of light for those that are there. He ministered to those there visiting from Brazil, sharing his experiences while he was in Brazil, because he says they are the hungriest people he has ever met. And he tells Bethel to get ready for a season of signs and wonders. He has a glass of water and a glass of grape juice sitting on the pulpit. He paraphrases John 2, dealing with the first miracle Jesus did, turning water into wine. And he says, signs and wonders are not the desserts of the gospel. He says, if God chose to reveal his son through signs and wonders, he wonders if that is a good method to preach the gospel. This is about two hours, 41 minutes and 55 seconds in. He quotes John four. He doesn't say the verse, but he says, what chapter? And he says, unless you see signs and wonders, how will you believe? This is what he tells them. And this is the verse that he uses in order to validate their need for signs and wonders. I just want to point this out. I would encourage you to go read that account. This is actually John 4, 48, which is the account of the official son in Cana needing to be healed. So Jesus had returned to Cana in Galilee, where he had performed the miracle of turning water into wine. And while he's in Cana, a man who is an official has a son who's ill, and he approaches Jesus, asking him to come and heal his son. And I actually looked in three different commentaries after looking up this verse, And they all said the same thing, that Jesus saying this is a rebuke to the official and to the other Galileans. They would not believe Jesus was the Messiah without signs and wonders. This is not something to emulate or to quote in support of signs and wonders today. And I think that that's something to point out. My point, as always, when doing these episodes is to encourage you to go back to scripture when anybody refers to a Bible verse, anyone. 
You need to be responsible and to grow in your understanding of Scripture. And just because someone quotes a Bible verse doesn't mean that they're using it in context. Context truly matters. So the context here is not something to emulate. It's actually a correction toward the Galileans. They would not believe that Jesus was the Messiah unless they saw signs and wonders. And that should tell us something right there, that the gospel in itself, confessing and proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is sufficient. It is the power of gospel. And he's going to use that verse, Romans 1.16, a couple of times in his message to almost use it in a way that that um, validates the signs and wonders. That's the power of the gospel. That is not the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel lies within what Christ did on the cross and the tomb that's empty. He has them repeat him quite often in what he says. He says that comparison distances you from the very thing you long for when you see it working in another's life. And when you celebrate what God is doing in another person's life, then you pair with them and you'll get your breakthrough. He says we are to chase after Jesus. We should not be fighting with one another, but be in unity, talking about different aspects and different revivals he notes as significant. He said the Lord is unifying the church, and he said that we have, have it better than Adam and Eve did when walking with the Lord in the garden, and that God being inside of us is far closer, referring to the Passion Translation, Colossians 1.27, which I will not read. He says Jesus came to transform a life. He says when someone gets touched by Jesus to not mock it, quoting Romans 1.16, and that is, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and the Gentile. So again, that understanding here is the power of God is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we believe that we have to add signs and wonders to the gospel in order for it to be effective, we're, we're essentially creating additions to the gospel and we're adding to it, which scripture warns us not to do such things. We are to be very cautious in that and to say that those are required in order for people to come to Christ. He says Jesus is going to come into these people and make them a sign and wonder. That's what he tells the people in the, in the room. He says it is imperative that Jesus touches you with his glory. And it is going to get wild in there, inviting others to come up and testify of what God has done, healing, encounters with Jesus, and etc. Richard said that you can take people in the Spirit where you have been in the Spirit, and that people need to open their hands and to receive what he is saying. He says there are a bunch of tall glasses of water in the room, and he asked for them to be radically touched by his power. They begin to sing hallelujah repetitively, and he tells those who have been crying during the service to come to the front. The altar fills, and he instructs them to repent. As, as those that have responded right now, I want you to repeat something after me. Say this out loud, every person. I repent for partnering with comparison. I choose to celebrate the person on my left and right. Jesus, I'm sorry for partnering with an anointing killer. <laughs> and God, I pray that you would pour joy into my soul. I want to pray of you now. God, I speak to the hopeless and I declare in Jesus' name that joy would be their portion and their strength. Lord God, I thank you that these tears are not just tears, but they're a sign that the soul is getting touched right now. And, and so Holy Spirit, I thank you that you came for the souls of man. I ask God that you would come and you would release your life over the souls right now in Jesus' name. And I speak to the wellsprings of life and I say, spring up, oh He repeats for a well to spring up. And he says for those who want a radical touch from God to stand up. Breakthrough. I thank you, Lord God. People have traveled from afar to be here tonight for breakthrough. Oh, God, I ask Jesus that you would mark a people powerfully. If you would say to me, Rich, I want a radical touch from God. I'm going to count to three. I want you to stand with both hands raised. One, two, and three by faith quickly as you can. Oh, Holy Spirit, I ask that your fire would rest upon your people right now. God, would you mark them with your glory? God, I ask Jesus from the back to the front, the fire of God to be on this place. 
place. The fire of God to be in this place. God, that should mark hands, that should mark hearts, that should mark heads. God, that should put them on like a glove. Oh, I speak to these keys and I say, swing wide, you gates. Swing wide, you doors. And let the King of glory come in. Every one of you is a gate. And every one of you is a door. And God wants to swing you wide to let this glory come in. And on three, we're going to make a sound. And what is going to happen is the doors are going to go swinging open. It was when I was 17 that I walked into a church and they started singing for the, and I heard worship for the first time in my life. And something inside of me said, this thing is real. It was the sound that opened up this door. When I count to three, I want you to make a sound as if your sound is going to open the door on the person on your left and the person on your right. Oh God, I ask that there would be a sound released in this place. A sound released in this place that would swing wide the doors, swing wide the ancient gates and let the King of Glory come in. And one, two, and three, fire in this place, 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 fire in this place. The fire of God in this place. The fire of God in this place. The fire of God in this place. You know, when you're in an atmosphere like this, whether there's hundreds of people in the room, and many of us have been in services like this numerous times, or you've been in a stadium with thousands of people chanting and yelling and screaming and the 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 tension building and it building again to that climactic point of eruption and excitement. It is very contagious and it's addictive. And it's also very influential because you're in a room with many other people that are doing this. And if you aren't paying attention to what's going on or you don't have a understanding biblically of of what the gospel is because the gospel wasn't presented. And that's the sad, one of the many sad things about listening to this video. And I did listen to it. I listened to it twice to, to make sure that I was presenting things properly. The, the gospel is not presented and you hear him focus on the people that they're the keys and, the, and that they're the doors and that they're, that they need to be swung wide open for the King of glory to come in. That's a, and that's again, a, a reference in the book of Psalms. So there's references to scripture, but at the same time, it, it seems to be not in the proper context. And then there's almost this undertone in it, too, that when people release this sound, and sound is a big thing in this movement. I mean, sound is focused on quite a bit, especially the sound in worship. And we've got to release a special, a special sound in order to unlock things in the spirit and in order for the man or woman of God to be able to flow as they should in their anointing in the spirit. Or we've got to have a special sound because that's what's going to usher in the glory of God. There's very much a, an, uh, an emphasis on the sound that needs to be released. And I would just ask, where do we see that in scripture that we're told to do that? That that we need to produce a sound in order for God to do something. But at any rate, you notice that there is a focus on sound. And there's a focus on when you release your shout that it's gonna set the ne person next to you free. And it almost gives the impression that that's the gospel. And I'm not saying that that's what he means, but I'm saying that when I'm listening to this, that that was the impression. It was as if your shout is what's going to set someone free. Again, it's the gospel that's ministered, proclaimed according to scripture that sets the captive free, that brings deliverance. Salvation is deliverance, my friend. Let's not forget that, um, that he has delivered us from the penalty of sin. He has delivered us from the power of sin. And one day we will be delivered from the presence of sin. That is glorious. 
We and we should we should not undermine that in any way, shape, or fashion. And the thing is, with with any of us, there is that great temptation as human beings that we're uh, there's always the more that we're seeking. There's got to be more than what I'm feeling right now. There's got to be more than what I'm experiencing right now. Because we're not satisfied, and there and there's there's a, there's a sinful part of us that is grabbing onto something more. Because if we feel it, or we can have an experience or an encounter, then it's real. Whereas we see in Scripture, and and yes, I understand that people have experiences. I'm not diminishing that. We're not robots. I understand we have experiences every single day of our lives. But when we begin to define ourselves as believers by experiences and not testing them in accordance with scripture we are going down dangerous paths and we're even going down paths that are paths that are going astray from god from the truth of his word and then we'll begin to use those experiences that shout that sound and we'll begin to think i have to have that in order for it to truly be god I have to experience this. I have to release this sound. Otherwise, God can't do something. I have to have this A, B, and C, whatever the minister's telling me or what I've been told to to understand about who God is and what is to be expected in my life as a Christian. That if I don't have this, and if I live a boring life, then I'm just not a believer. And my friend, I want to tell you right now, that's not true. That is a lie that will be told and it will be perpetuated. So I, I have compassion for the people in this room because I've been in services where everybody is engaging and there is this uh, in, this increase, this crescendo, this, again, this this eruption that is getting ready to spring forth. And, and the focus is on you releasing that sound and you're doing something. And it's done in sincerity in many people. There are many people in, the, in that room that are standing there, and they sincerely want to grow closer to God, but they are not being led properly. There's no preaching of the gospel. There's very little mention of scripture. When there is scripture mentioned, it's from the Passion Translation. And I can't express this to you enough. Run away from the Passion Translation. It will confuse you, and it will deceive you, and it will lead you in a way that it's romanticizing God and it's telling you that how other translations plainly state what the text says about God and is sufficient in the glory and in, in revealing the glory and the majesty of God because the Holy Spirit is not insufficient in leading men along as he did and carried them to write down the word of God and to express and to reveal Christ which that's what the Holy Spirit does. He reveals Christ. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting off on a tangent here. But you don't need some trend that's not even a translation to tell you the heart of God. Scripture has done that sufficiently. Thank you very much. All right. So we're going to keep moving on with what Richard Gordon did. But I just want to express that. Uh, that there's just great concern of and coming out of this and understanding. I know what it feels like to to stand in one of those rooms and to have this build up and build up and build up, or to stand in a gathering and to have this great build up, and that you're told you're supposed to do all this and you're supposed to release a shout and you're supposed to decree and declare and prophesy and you're supposed to do all of these things, and then what happens after a couple weeks? Um, or signs and wonders are going to break out. And this is what we view as the gospel needing assistance, if you will, in order for it to be powerful. Scripture's enough. Scripture's sufficient. And we've got to get back to that and, and get back to seeing the, the glory and the majesty um, of, of who God is in the Word of God in the proper context. Richard goes on to tell the people to keep receiving. And then he goes to sections of the room to release the fire of God yet again, because it would seem, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here, it would seem the first time wasn't enough. Oh, hold hands. Hold hands here, that section over there, just hold hands. Fire of God in this place. Fire of God in this place. Fire of God in this place. Tell that section all over there to hold hands, that whole row, the third row. Hold hands. All the Brazilians, third row. Open your hands, lift them up. One, two, the fire of God in this place right now. The fire of God in this place. The fire of God right there. Shete, Kete, this lady here. What's your name? 
Open up your hands. Close your eyes. Stretch your hands out here. Priscilla, the Lord has brought you here. And I see a breakthrough for your mother and your mother's side of the family. And I see God's hand upon you right now. And God would mark you at fire, that a door would open up and the whole family would get touched. Someone just behind her right now. Go, we ask in one, two, the fire of God right now. The fire of God right now. The fire of God right now. Wow, give the Lord a clap quickly. Give the Lord a clap. This whole section here, just hold hands very quickly. This whole section, just hold hands. Just hold hands, this section here. Can you lift up the keys a little bit? Just lift up the keys. Just a little louder. Just open your hands. Woo! All the ministering spirits. All the ministering angelic spirits. God, we thank you. I see a breakthrough, a spirit of breakthrough resting in this section. I see even there's a court deal that's getting done. The Lord says it's happening, it's breaking. Those that have been pursuing the miraculous. I ask in Jesus' name, this whole section, the fire of God, the fire of God, the fire of God, the fire of God. That was not me looping over again, the fire of God. It was said probably dozens of times. And I want you to also notice too, this is a side note, how he wants the music turned up. He wants the keys louder. I wonder what would happen if they had no music playing in the background. <laughs> because it, again, there sometimes there seems to be um, a heavy influence uh, and dependency on the background music to set the tone and to set the atmosphere. So I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud there. He thanks the Holy Spirit for the anointing to break the yokes, and he continues to go into sections and releasing fire upon people. He continues to repeat the fire of God. He tells people to lift their hands and to glorify Jesus, and the release of the fire of God continues. That section over there, just run my team, my ministry team. Fire of God. Freedom, freedom, freedom. She's from Brazil. The fire of God on her. The fire of God on her. There's a worship anointing on your lap. This section over here, raise all your hands. I want you to hold hands. Hold hands right now. Holy Spirit, I ask God for an impartation. Oh, Jesus of the power of God, right now. One, two, three, the fire of God. The fire of God. The fire of God, the fire of God, the fire of God, the fire of God. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. Fire God. Shit. If you sense the anointing in the room, give me a wave right now. Look around the room. Either you're crazy or God is here. I want you to put a hand on someone near you and pray for a wild Holy Spirit encounter. If they let you put your hand by their belly and go, fire God. Why don't you do that with me? Put a hand on someone near you and say, fire God. Richard quotes Romans 1.16 again after this, continuing to chant about the fire of God, and he tells them to put hands on someone next to them and say, fire. He said, there is an invitation for a wild glory, that they are going to ro rolling in the floor and also serving others and going to them and releasing the fire of God. Singing erupts in uh, singing Yeshua in syllables and repetitively, and he says there is a grace for signs and wonders in the room, and he calls it an open heaven in there. He encourages people to test their bodies and to see if pain has left their bodies or healing has taken place. And there's people that come up that tell of their necks not hurting anymore, or their hips or their, uh, their ankles not hurting anymore, just different things that are taking place. And he says the presence of healings proves that Jesus is alive. Now, I have a question. Is that the proof? So we again, he's going back to this, this belief of signs and wonders must take place in order for people to believe that Jesus is alive. And now I'm not saying that healings don't take place today, that God doesn't heal, and that there aren't miraculous things that are inexplicable that, that happen. I'm not saying that because they do, because God is God and he's sovereign and he's going to do what he wants to do. And there are things that happen beyond our finite understanding that demonstrates and shows us 
that yes, God is powerful and that he has willed this to happen and that he has, uh, in his sovereignty, he has chosen to heal or he's chosen to do a miracle. But the question is, are those things necessary in order to show that Jesus is alive? The whole premise that Jesus is alive is based, again, on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the question is, are they conflating and ad- and adding to the gospel in saying something like that? Because that is not the proof that we look for that Jesus is alive. We have the word of God testifying of Christ, the gospel. And some takeaways from this and observations, again, There was little to any ministering of the Word of God. There was more of a focus on the fire of God and a way to have manifestations that built up emotionalism, sensationalism. And uh, Richard makes a point earlier on in the service to say people have made a comment to him saying, well, you just like manifestations. And he said, no, they just happen around me a lot. I would just take that into consideration uh, because there was a lot, again, emotionalism, sensationalism going on in the room. The gospel was not presented. There, the gospel was not presented. I cannot stress that enough, which is the power of God unto salvation. I would also like to point out this observation and give you something to think about. With the exception of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation who will call down fire, it says, and do signs and wonders. Who can you list in the New Testament that called down fire from heaven? Who actually commanded God's fire to come down? Who, who did that? We don't see the apostles doing that, and we, furthermore, we don't see people calling down a metaphorical fire in order for you to burn with more passion and more zeal and more desire. I think that we need to take that into consideration. So as we end our time today, um, I, I like to leave off with a few things that are going to help steer you in a direction to begin to look if you're wondering about the fire of God and what does it mean in Scripture Then I'm going to share some references with you in the description below, some links that you can go to to get you started on looking and reading the Bible. Get get a concordance. Go through and see how many times the fire is talked about. Go to the verses and see what the context was and see if uh, the fire of God uh, results in what we just heard today as an example. Does it result in people rolling around the floor laughing? Is God's fire representing anything else other than uh, we just want more of you and we want to have a, a fresh zeal for you? And there's nothing wrong with zeal. There's nothing wrong with having a desire for God because we should we should have a desire for the truth of God's word. We should have a desire um, to understand his word and grow in fellowship with God. I'm not discounting that. What I am saying is, is that there is a a tendency to focus on the emotional aspect of this. And because I felt something, that must be the fire of God going through fire tunnels. I don't know how many times I participated in fire tunnels and I went through fire tunnels. We need to understand the fire of God. One of the articles that I found uh, that may be of help to you was from gotquestions.org. And it's called, What is the Baptism of By With Fire? And I'll just share a little bit of this with you, but I'm going to have the link to it below. But uh, in this article, they talk about how John the Baptist came preaching repentance and baptizing in the wilderness of Judea, and he was sent as a herald to announce the arrival of Jesus, the Son of God. That's in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And he announced, I indeed baptize you with water and unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And if you go on to read in Matthew, the it seems when in context that fire is judgment. Verse 12 says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So it seems that that is, again, re- referencing something you don't want when you're calling fire down, which is God's judgment. And again, this article is talking about what the baptism with fire is. The article says, some interpret the baptism of fire as referring to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was sent from heaven and referring to Acts chapter two, verses two and three. And it is important to note, they say that these were tongues as of fire, uh, not literal fire. Some believe that the baptism with fire refers to the Holy Spirit spirit's office as the energizer of the believer's service and the purifier of evil within because of the exhortation do not quench the spirit in first thessalonians 5 19 the command to the believer is not to put out the spirit's fire by suppressing his ministry 
They note that the third and more likely interpretation is that the baptism of fire refers to judgment, as we just mentioned in Matthew 3. They say in all four gospel passages mentioned above, Mark and John speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but only Matthew and Luke mention the baptism with fire. The immediate context of Matthew and Luke is judgment. The context of Mark and John is not. We know that the Lord Jesus is coming in flaming fire to judge those who do not know God. But praise be to God that he will save all that will come and put their trust in him. So I will share the link to that. There's also uh, another article I'll share with you that they have is How is the Holy Spirit Like a Fire? So I'll share the link to that below. There's one more article I wanted to touch on that I found quite interesting uh, in my research of this, trying to find some uh, some reputable sources to consider um, on the opposite side from the experiential part of what we heard today. This is a an article from the Cripple Gate, and this was published in 2014 by Lyndon Unger. He also has some very interesting videos, by the way. I posted one on my resource page on my blog for Post NAR, and it's called The History of the Charismatic Movement. It's fascinating. I would encourage you to go listen to that. That link is posted on there. And uh, some of you may be surprised to find out some things if, if you think that you know the history of the charismatic movement. The Burning Away Misconceptions About Holy Fire, Lyndon Unger published this on there January 24th of 2014. And he was actually brought up in a charismatic church. He entered the faith via a charismatic, um, is what he, he says. And uh, he says, one of the most quickly redefined terms was fire. Fire used to be what you called the results of tossing a match on something flammable or maybe something you did with a gun. Now it meant something way different. In charismatic circles, there's often talk about fire of some sort, holy fire, divine fire, heavenly fire, the fire of God, etc. The idea of fire is basically paralleled with one or more of the following ideas. Spiritual passion, having an emotionally intense worship, church service, really getting serious with God or some form of personal revival, or some sort of outpouring of divine power on a person, church meeting, event resulting in a renewed passion of some sort, i.e. evangelism, or various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, such as euphoria, tongues, healings, prophecies, miracles, holy laughter, holy glue, holy vomiting, barking, crying, being slain, laid out in the Spirit, visions, trances, screaming, physical pain, teleportation, etc., Unger says, I had generally gone along with the charismatic usage of the term fire with regards to passion or zeal and not really questioned it since the term is often used in non-charismatic circles in nearly identical ways. But as I've grown in my knowledge of the Lord and his word, I found myself continually questioning my own assumptions and understandings and going back to the drawing board. When we speak of fire in the previously mentioned ways, are we using the term in a proper biblical sense? And he notes in here, and I'm, just for time's sake, he lists many scriptures for this. So I would encourage you, please read this article and do your own Bible study on this if this is something that you're wanting to know more about. He says there's only one real way to objectively answer the question. So he goes through the 430 occurrences of fire in the ESV. And he says uh, most people who use the term aren't doing original language exegesis. So the first one, he says, there are many references to physical fire, the fire that that firefighters need to put out in Scripture. And there's a long list. I will I'll just tell you, it goes from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> That's what I'll tell you. He says, anticipating objections to some of those, I'd say there are some occurrences where fire is used in a metaphor, but the term fire itself isn't being used as a metaphor for something else. In other words, in a simile where something is hot like fire, the fire being referred to isn't itself metaphorical for something else. Number two, he says, God's physical presence is often manifest in some sort of physical fire, at least appearance in the Bible. So he goes through the different examples where you can find that, and there's quite a few. So I, again, read this article. Number three, God's judgment is often performed with physical fire. So he mentions the examples such as in Genesis 19.24 of Sodom and Gomorrah, the plague of hail and fire in Exodus 9.23, God killing Nadab and Abihu with, uh, with fire because of the strange fire they brought in Leviticus 10. And two, uh, he and he goes on. There's there's several that he lists here that we can see. Um, he talks about God's eschatological judgment of sinners and creation will be performed with fire. We see this in Second Thessalonians one eight, Hebrews ten twenty seven, James three six, Second Peter three verse seven, and goes on in even into the book of Revelation. Number four, the, the area that we see fire in in Scripture, he lists, is fire is used as a relatively wide-ranging metaphor several times in the Scriptures. 
And so we see that that God is an all-consuming fire, and the consuming nature of fire is used as a metaphor for destruction, uh, desolation, either by God or by men. Fire is used as a metaphor for God's judgment and wrath. He lists several verses for that. There's quite a few that he lists. Uh, the consuming nature of fire is used as a metaphor to describe how wealth acquired through bribery doesn't last. So there's numerous things in here. I would just please read it. <laughs> I can't express that enough. So he, the points to take home, this is what I want to, as we wind down, the points to take home he, he mentions in this article. Unger says, first of all, the spirit who authored scripture never ever uses fire in a metaphorical sense, describing passion, excitement, commitment, or fervor. The only metaphorical usages related to emotions are of anger and wrath. Let me just say that one more time, just so, so you hear it and take this in, okay? The spirit who authored scripture never, ever uses fire in a metaphorical sense, describing passion, excitement, commitment, fervor, etc. The only metaphorical usages related to emotions are of anger and wrath. And he says, I have rarely heard a charismatic or continuationist use the idea of holy fire in reference to God's wrath or anger. I know what you're thinking, though. I know that getting fired up or being on fire is an English expression of speech, but that leads to the second point. He says, number two, the spirit never, ever uses fire in the context of cultivation of spiritual renewal, fervor, or conviction. There's never talk of holy fire in the scriptures, at least in the sense that the phrase is regularly used in charismatic circles. The phrase doesn't even appear in the scriptures at all. And he says, all of this talk of holy fire isn't talking about actually burning things, God manifesting his presence in physical fire, divine judgment, or any of the metaphorical uses in scripture. When people talk about holy fire, they're not talking about God raining down judgment on his enemies. So who cares? Right? Well, these are two things that he wants us to consider. Number one, when a person conflates biblical terminology and idioms with modern terminology and idioms, they twist the scriptures. So that's why we need to make sure we're reading verses such as Matthew 3, 11 in context um, and to understand what it's meaning and to, and to not be grabbing onto things that are actually misrepresenting God. Number two, if you pray for God's fire in your life and experience suffering, God's giving you exactly what you asked for. And that's a sobering thought to think of. And I know that that's, that's offensive to some people when you say that. But we really need to understand when we're asking for God's fire, what we're asking for. Now, we understand that there are also passages in Scripture where it talks about that God's fire is like a refining fire, that it's, and in refiner's fire, metal is placed into the fire to where the impurities come up out of the metal so that they uh, come to the surface and then can be taken out. It's called the dross. And so I'm, I know that metaphorically speaking, we, we know that God is sanctifying us and he's refining us and that we, we want that. Sometimes we don't want the way in which he does that. That's the thing. But we need to go back to the word of God in context and to understand what the fire is and, and to lovingly and, but firmly say what we just heard, that's not the fire of God. And, and uh, th- that's emotionalism. This is emotionalism that is that people are being worked up into a frenzy almost. And because they feel something, that that equates to the fire of God. And let me reiterate this one more time out of compassion. I understand what that's like. I understand being in those um, environments. And this is not coming from someone that wasn't in those. What I'm telling you is... If you still hold to those things, you need to test them against scripture. Your experiences and the real tangible feelings that you have are not the markers for truth. Scripture is. And him doing a work in your life and understanding also that when you're asking for the fire of God, you need to make sure you know what you're asking for. That That's a very serious thing to consider. And this is not a game that we're playing, and it's this is not something for hype. This is not something to um, stir the people up and and then just to get you on an addictive path because this can be addictive. You you will crave this feeling, and you will begin to think, well, if I don't feel this, or if I don't have the fire of God, if I'm not doing A, B, and C, if I'm not um, doing all of these things, if I'm not telling people about the love of God, if I'm not seeing signs and wonders, if I'm not doing all of these things, then I'm really a boring person, and I may not even be a Christian at all. And I just want to tell you right now, 
you having a, a simple, quiet life, which scripture actually tells us to do, <laughs> uh, that, that that honors God and you doing signs and wonders is not what marks you as a Christian. It is Christ's work on the cross and his finished work for the atonement of your sins and reconciling you to God and making you to be adopted into the family of God because you have put your faith and trust in Christ and uh, recognized your need for him as a sinner in need of repentance and in need of salvation and deliverance, that's what marks you as a Christian. It's not what you do. It's what he's done. And with that, I will end this, <laughs> this episode for today. And I hope that you found it helpful. And I hope that you will really go to scripture on certain topics that you are wanting to learn, understand more and stay in the word daily. Stay in the word, get in a biblically sound church, sit under solid teaching and grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And until our next time, when we look at another topic, be blessed today and encouraged by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.